What a blessing to be here, Catholic Workers Center, Mary House, 55 East Third Street. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. No, we are in space that has been consecrated by some of the most courageous and visionary fellow citizens produced by this nation. And if you listen close enough, you still hear the spirits of Brother Peter Morin and Sister Dorothy Day and Robert Ludlow and the early Michael Harrington and so many others. And now we've still got Sister Martha, Brother Carmen, and so many. Now give them all a hand. Give them all a hand. The tradition goes on. The tradition goes on each time I hear the word Dorothy and the other word they put together. It makes me shake. It makes me shudder. The way Faust shuddered in the realm of the mothers in Goethe's great classic of Faust. Examining who, in fact, am I as a human being and how can I do better or how can I strive to make a society that makes people, makes it easier for people to be good in the language of Brother Peter. So I was very blessed when I was asked to say a word about Dorothy Day. It's been now almost 30 years when I first began to study assiduously her corpus owing to my wonderful friendship and partnership and comradeship with brother Michael Harrington. We both work very closely, democratic socialists in America. We traveled the country together all through the early and mid 80s and then we'd steal away. He'd drink a little beer and I'd drink a little cognac. <laughs> we would often talk about Dorothy Days and the Martin Luther Kings and the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschels and the Norman Thomases. We would just call the list and go down person by person. What went into the making? Acknowledging that in so many ways they were made by the movements that they were a part of. They didn't drop out of the sky. And that's very much the case for our dearly beloved sister Dorothy Day. You can't talk about Dorothy Day without talking about John and Grace Day. We are who we are because somebody loved us. Somebody cared for us. Somebody targeted us. And yes, she was born November the 8th, 1897 in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> The greatest borough in the world. I love Manhattan, but Manhattan belongs to the world. Brooklyn is America. <laughs> you all know what I'm saying. Gut bucket Americana. Manhattan sophisticated, refined, and oh, so cosmopolitan. But that's where Dorothy Day comes from. She comes out of Brooklyn and then on to my state of California. And yes, indeed, she was in the East Bay in Oakland when that earthquake hit and shook that state, or shook that section of the state for two minutes and 20 seconds. And in so many ways, it was one of the pivotal moments in her life, even as a young person. Actually, William James was there too, lecturing at Stanford, shook the foundations of his philosophy. <laughs> But she never forgot it because early on she had intimate relations with the catastrophic. And they, though that's a natural catastrophe, we know that she was able to see social catastrophe, economic catastrophe, political catastrophe, ecological catastrophe. And we have to draw a radical distinction between the catastrophic and the problematic. The problematic are those who are obsessed with the mainstream and the streamlined, usually obsessed with trying to become, trying to gain access to it and ending up 
well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference. And she knew, as the great Heschel used to say, that indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself. It becomes a way of life, hardening of the heart and a coarsening of the conscience, a chilling of the soul, turning one's back to the vulnerable, turning one's back to the despised and the weak. But William James would also say indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. And how do you shift from that chilliness and that numbness to being on fire? And she understood, as did Martin King, and as did John Coltrane, <laughs> that in the end, it's about a love supreme. And I would hope you all get a chance in the next week to read that section in her classic, The Long Loneliness, called Love Overflows, and listen to it against the backdrop of a love supreme. <laughs> and if Coltrane's a little bit too much for you, maybe you want to listen to a little Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Because <laughs> you got a whole lot of love there, but you're going to have words in that. <laughs> And I want you to keep track of Sister Dorothy's text. Because when you think of Dorothy Day, you think of love overflowing. But it's not abstract, it's not ephemeral, it's not fleeting. It is rooted and grounded in the catastrophic. That's why she takes so seriously line 38 of Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. But she understood, as Malcolm X always said, the examined life is painful. It takes courage to cut against the grain, nonconformist, being willing to bear witness to something grander than you. And she always acted as if she were part of something bigger than her. She was fundamentally tied into forms of conversion. She was first converted, interesting, by text. She was an intellectual. She loved the life of the mind. She was engaged in the world of ideas. It was Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. It was Jack London's The Road that changed her and led her to fall in love with those sly stone called everyday people. <laughs> or those James Cleveland called ordinary people. Now in her day, they called it the masses. But she corrected them, especially after a Christian conversion after her time with our beloved secular leftist intellectuals and playwrights and artists and activists. She said, no, they're not masses, they're people. They're temples of the Holy Spirit. They're made in the image and likeness of God, which means each and every one of them, like you, like me, unique, distinctive, irreducible, irreproducible, no one like us. And never will be any individual like us. That's not masses, which is homogeneous and monolithic. That allows you to take a detached disposition, oftentimes to view them as objects of manipulation rather than subjects that one has an eye, thou relation with, in the language of our dear brother Martin Buber. How do we stay in contact with the rich humanity of each and every person? What begins with the Socratic, the, the examine life. And we know from the Greek, it says that examine life is not a life for the human. In our English word human derives from the Latin humando, and humando means what? Burying. Humanity, humility, tied to burying. We're on our way to death. And Sister Dorothy never forgot the most terrifying question that we will ever raise to ourselves. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creature born between urine and feces? That's who we are. And that's what I love about Sister Dorothy, that she had a resistance 
to deodorize discourses about human beings. She always kept it funky. <laughs> she kept it real. Our dear brother Tom Cornell and our magnificent mass, I was so blessed to be there and be a part of it. He talked about Dorothy Day's authenticity. She was genuine. She was the real thing. What you see was what you got. She was able to bring together head and heart and soul and body and allow her whole being and her whole voice to be heard. And yes, she changed her mind. Why? Because she was so credit. She believed in relentless self-criticism, self-scrutiny, self-interrogation. But she also knew that in the end, if you're wrestling with what it is to be human, you have to make some very difficult and painful choices if you take seriously your quest from mama's womb to tomb to bear witness to something greater than you and of course for her it was always centered on the fundamental love even in her pre-christian years she fell in love with wisdom very much like Socrates. Socrates fell in love with wisdom. But Dorothy Day found wisdom in the greatest literary tradition in the modern world, the Russians. <laughs> oh yes, Dostoevsky, Kirillov, in the possess. I've always been haunted by God. I can hear her reading that over. I can see her reading that over and over again. Yes, Sister Dorothy, we see your soul mirrored in the soul wrestling of Fyodor Dostoevsky, who also was on intimate terms with the prison cell, like yourself. You could see it in Dostoevsky's definition of hell in her one of her favorite novels, and one of the greatest novels of all time, the brothers, Karamazov. But Dostoevsky says what? Hell is suffering from the incapacity to love. That's his psychological definition of it. It's very much like Hamlet. He suffers from the incapacity to love. He doesn't really love Ophelia. What do you love, Hamlet? Well, I thought I loved ideas, but even the ideas are leading me such a radical skepticism that the melancholy is overcoming me. Do I really have the capacity to love, especially love my neighbor, not just love abstract principles, philosophical reflection, or wisdom in the broad sense? Do you love that fallible, finite creature next to you? And do you love that poor unloved, uncared for child living on the other side of town. Dorothy Day, building on her love of literature. And I say that in all explicitness, because for her, art was in no way a form of artificial entertainment or narrow stimulation. It had to do with nurturing her soul and refining her sense of who she was so that she, her armor became thicker, her spiritual armor, her moral, her political, her communal armor became thicker in her move from John and Grace Day to November 1980, when she experienced what we all will, the culinary delight of terrestrial worms coming at our bodies, the end of our death sentence in time and space, and looking forward to the next stage based on your theology. 